Good morning and welcome to Old Fort Niagara. I am Robert Emerson. I'm the executive director of the Old Fort Niagara Association. And today we're gonna to talk about the fort's role in the American Revolution. So we have a PowerPoint again today and we'll just go to that right now. All right, so Fort Niagara in the American Revolution probably the zenith uh, of the fort's impact on uh, North American history um, was, came during the American Revolution. Well, the war was fought from 1775 until 1783. And as you can see from this map, most of the major actions of the war took place along the Eastern seaboard. Uh, all the way from uh, Maine down into Georgia. So um, where does Fort Niagara fit into this, uh, into this conflict? We certainly, when we study the revolution, we certainly read, I think, mostly about uh, the major battles that took place, um, Bunker Hill, um, Brandywine, Long Island, um, Yorktown, uh, battles in the, in the Carolinas, read a lot about those, but you don't hear so much about the war in the back country, and that's uh, the role that Fort Niagara played in this conflict. So the British held Fort Niagara during the entire war. They had captured it from the French in 1759, and they held it till 1796. So the whole time the American Revolution was going on, the British are in control of Fort Niagara. This is their headquarters on the Great Lakes and possession of this fort and some others allowed the British to keep control of the Great Lakes. And this meant that they um, had access to the vulnerable back door um, of, of the, uh, particularly the colonies of New York, Pennsylvania and Virginia. Now you see the stars on this map. Uh, this really shows the major British outposts that um, controlled the Great Lakes, Oswegatchie uh, in the east, and then there's Fort Niagara there at the western, uh, southwestern end of Lake Ontario, Detroit uh, over to the west, and then Michilimackinac up in northern Michigan. The fort during the revolution was garrisoned by several companies of regular redcoat soldiers, the 8th Regiment of Foot. So the 8th is headquartered at Niagara, but they're spread all the way from Oswegatchie to Michilimackinac. Uh, so they're, they're really spread out all over the, the Great Lakes. Also at Niagara, Niagara was a headquarters for the Indian Department, and this was a quasi-military organization, and their responsibility was to maintain good diplomatic relations with Native American nations. Um, they also enlisted them in the war effort as the war went on. So the Indian Department sort of played a dual role as frontier diplomats, um, as well as, as soldiers uh, going out with, with raiding parties quite frequently. The other thing that was important about Fort Niagara during the revolution was it was a refuge for loyalists, people, Americans who remained loyal to the king. Uh, many people from the upper Susquehanna Valley and the, the Mohawk Valley um, who were loyalists uh, left their homes and they wanted to go to a place where the British were in control. Well, for, for people living in those frontier regions, uh, Fort Niagara was uh, a lot better choice 
than say trying to make your way through uh, to uh, New York City, for example, where after uh, 1776, the British controlled uh, New York. Fort Niagara is also a, a naval base. Of course, the, uh, the British fleet on Lake Ontario can, can only go on Lake Ontario. They, they can't, there's no canal yet <clears throat> to go up to Lake Erie. And uh, you're gonna be able to go into the upper St. Lawrence, but there's a lot of rapids in the St. Lawrence. So um, they have, British have a naval base on the upper St. Lawrence, but they also have uh, ships out here at Fort Niagara. Fort Niagara is going to be a base for raids on the frontier. As we said, its, it's location allowed raiding parties from here and from Detroit to enter the vulnerable back door of the uh, colonies. Uh, so the British are going to supply and, and arm and, and provision the, uh, these raiding parties that are going to leave from here or from Native American villages that have uh, connections uh, to here. So let's look at the fort itself. Here is a map that was drawn of the fort in 1780. Uh, it's called the Terret map. And you can see um, the fort itself. Uh, you can see that there's a the French castle down there in the lower left-hand corner, there's a cluster of buildings in front of it. Um, further up uh, the map are some barracks buildings, uh, uh, the redoubts are there, the provision storehouse, the powder magazine, and then the, uh, at the very top are the outer works. Looking down in the lower right-hand corner, uh, there are some, uh, some sutlers buildings and uh, some Indian department buildings uh, where the Coast Guard station is today. That was called the Bottoms because it was right down next to the Niagara River. Well, the fort um, evolves during the American Revolution. Here are two maps. The one on the left shows the fort as it looked in 1773. And you'll notice on this map that there is a rectangular bastioned stockade. If you were with us uh, last week, you learned about bastions, but you can see this, uh, this wooden stockade that surrounded the castle and the buildings immediately in front of it. And that was, uh, that was put back there in 1768 as a way to uh, try to beef up the defenses of the fort. Uh, the old walls that the French had constructed during the French and Indian War were eroding, and in fact, you could walk right over them. So one of the solutions the British used to uh, put the fort in a better state of defense was to put the stockade back in that the French, the French had had a stockade earlier. So the British put one in around the castle. That kind of became the citadel uh, of the fort. Well, um, You'll notice that in the map on the right, which is 1780, that that stockade is gone. Um, and we'll get into why that happened in, in just a minute, but the British were forced to make some improvements to the fort and, and make the main walls much more defensible after 1779. So that inner stockade really became redundant and they uh, took it out. Of course, these two buildings, uh, the North and South Redoubt, uh, were built before the revolution, 1770 and 1771. So these would have been, of the buildings that are extant today, these would have been the newest buildings um, in the fort um, when the revolution breaks out. So who commanded Fort Niagara? Well, there were a succession of commanders during the war years. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Caldwell, he came here with the 8th Regiment in 1774, uh, a year before the war starts. And he, he was here for about two years. 
he was succeeded, um, he died, uh, and he was succeeded by Lieutenant Colonel Mason Bolton, who was here for three years. After him came Brigadier General Henry Watson Powell. He commanded toward the end of the war. And then finally, uh, at the very end of the war was Brigadier Alan McLean. Now here's a weird fact about Fort Niagara. Um, at least I find it a little bit strange. Lieutenant Colonel John Caldwell was uh, ill and he died on October 31st. He was succeeded by Lieutenant Colonel Mason Bolton. Uh, Bolton wanted to return to England uh, and he finally got leave to do that. So he set sail in October of 1780 to head back to England aboard the HMS Ontario, which went down in a storm uh, with all hands on October 31st, uh, 1780. So two successive commandants of Fort Niagara died on Halloween. I think that's a little weird. There were also a handful of Royal artillerymen here. Uh, these were specialists in, uh, in manning artillery pieces, but there weren't enough of them to go around. They actually had to train some infantry soldiers to help out with the guns in the event the fort uh, would be attacked. You'll notice the artillery soldier is not wearing a red coat. The artillery is a different branch and they're wearing blue. Well, uh, there were other British regulars at the fort for short periods of time uh, during crisis periods. Um, the man here on the left is the 34th Regiment of Foot. And the man on the right is from the 47th, just a small contingent um, uh, later on in the war um, as Fort Niagara was threatened. Uh, during the same time, 1779, 1780, um, briefly, there were troops here from Hesse Hanau, which is a German principality that um, rented troops to King George III um, to help uh, put down the rebellion in North America. There was a small detachment of artillery shown here on the left and a small detachment of Jaegers. These were riflemen, German riflemen uh, as well. Um, they weren't here for very long and they weren't particularly popular uh, among the British soldiers. Very brief period of time, the King's Royal Regiment of New York um, here at Fort Niagara, but again, only for a short, short time period. And then Butler's Rangers. Uh, this was a unit that was raised beginning in the fall of 1777, and they were going to go out on many, many raids along the frontier. They're gonna be based here at Niagara, um, billeted here over the winter when they're not on campaign. Um, so this is a, a soldier of Butler's Rangers. They were given green coats with white facings. And there's a bust of, of Lieutenant Colonel John Butler. Depending on which side of the border you live on uh, is what really determines your opinion of John Butler, whether he's a terrorist or a hero. So that's kind of what the, the garrison looks like. It's kind of what the fort looks like. Let's talk about the war itself very briefly. Uh, Lexington and Concord, those battles occur on April 19th, 1775 outside of Boston. So the British commander in chief, Thomas Gage, uh, sends word to Fort Niagara uh, of the uh, beginning of this conflict. And his orders are to cultivate the friendship of the Six Nations. The Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee people, uh, sometimes called the Iroquois. Um, so Gage is telling uh, Colonel Caldwell, who's in command here at the fort, to make sure we keep the, the uh, Six Nations friendly to the British cause, uh, thinking that you know, they might be needed. They certainly don't want the Six Nations to support the rebels. 
Well, shortly after the war begins, Congress decides that it would be cool to invade Canada and seize Montreal and Quebec. So uh, two expeditions are launched. One goes through the Maine wilderness under none other than Benedict Arnold. Uh, the other one uses the traditional route uh, down Lake Champlain. They take Montreal and these two armies converge on Quebec, uh, but uh, the attack does not succeed. And in 1776, the American army is slowly driven back down or back up Lake Champlain into New York. But what this does for Fort Niagara, it cuts Fort Niagara off from communication um, with the British. Uh, the British uh, are still in Boston um, and then later Halifax, but Fort Niagara is cut off from pretty much communication with, with their headquarters. Well, following orders to cultivate the Six Nations, there's a major council held here at Fort Niagara in May and June of 1776. They're trying to enlist the Six Nations to help the British war effort. And at first, the Six Nations are very reluctant to get involved in what they see as a white man's quarrel. Uh, in fact, uh, Gaiasuda says, you are a mad, foolish, crazy, and deceitful person for you think we are fools and advise us to do what is not our interest. So the, the British aren't getting much of a response from the Six Nations um, at, this, at this early 1776 council here at Niagara. Uh, another council in August of, and September of 1776 is really a diplomatic turning point. Western native nations, at this point, agreed to ally themselves with the British, uh, but uh, nothing happens immediately on a large scale. It's the 1777 campaign, really, when we're going to see a lot of Native Americans taking the field. And that, um, that campaign is uh, shown here on this map. The grand plan was to divide New England from the rest of the colonies. And this would be accomplished with an army led by General Burgoyne uh, going up again Lake Champlain from Canada uh, and going southward toward Albany. Supporting Burgoyne's main effort from the north would be a smaller expedition going down the Mohawk Valley. And that expedition is under Brigadier General Barry St. Ledger, or Sillinger, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it. That's going to come in from the west and ideally would meet um, Burgoyne near Albany. Uh, a third stroke was originally conceived to go up the Hudson River from New York, which the British now hold, uh, they, t they take New York in the fall of 1776, so they're going to stay in New York for the rest of the war. So that sort of three-pronged uh, attack is going to, hopefully for the British, divide New England, which they see as sort of the seedbed of the rebellion, from the rest of the colonies. That's the plan. Well, uh, the plan does not succeed, as we all know. Burgoyne is stopped at Saratoga and basically surrenders his entire army. The thrust from northward from New York City, um, General Howe, who's the, now the commander in chief, decides to attack Philadelphia instead. And we're gonna focus though on the, the uh, campaign to go down the Mohawk Valley. Uh, it was under, as we said before, St. Ledger. Uh, this image of St. Ledger on the right, uh, it's been, a, it's been uh, attributed as him for many, many years, but recently historians have called that into doubt, thinking that this might be an image of a relative 
and not Barry St. Ledger himself. But nonetheless, um, St. Ledger draws troops. He draws native warriors from Niagara. His, uh, his main army comes up the St. Lawrence. They're gonna use the old route from Oswego up Oneida Lake, across the Oneida Carry, which we talked about uh, last time, and then down the Mohawk River. Um, there's a barrier in the way though, and, and that's Fort Schuyler. This uh, fort was built as Fort Stanwix in the French and Indian War. It's rebuilt by the Americans uh, in the early years of the revolution. St. Ledger thinks that it's not gonna be a very uh, tough uh, capture, but he is unaware of how much work the Americans have done to rebuild this fort. By the way, this is a national historic site. You can go and visit this fort. It's in Rome, New York. It's been reconstructed on its original, original site. So St. Ledger, his artillery that he's brought with him is really too light for the job. He lays siege to Fort Schuyler. Well, the Tryon County Militia, Tryon is the westernmost county in the settled part of, of New York. Um, the Tryon County Militia uh, decides they're gonna break through to relieve the siege of Fort Stanwix. So they're marching westward toward the fort and uh, they get stopped. They get stopped by, uh, the British are warned that they're coming. They get stopped by a, a force of uh, loyalist troops and Native Americans. And a really very, very bloody battle is fought at Oriskany. Some historians say that for the number of soldiers involved, this is one of the bloodiest battles of the Revolutionary War. Highest casualty rates anyway. It's fought uh, tree to tree hand-to-hand -hand in some cases, but the upshot is that Herkimer, General Herkimer, who commanded the militia column, is stopped and he cannot break through to Fort Schuyler. Well, no matter, because um, even though the relief force is stopped, Fort Schuyler holds out, uh, St. Ledger has to withdraw and so the, the defense of the upper Mohawk Valley is successful, uh, thanks to the garrison of Fort Stan with Fort Schuyler. Well, John Butler, uh, he was uh, an Indian department official. Um, he had recruited a lot of natives to support St. Ledger's attack. Uh, so now the, that, that the army has been forced to withdraw, uh, there's going to be a different idea put in place. So John Butler in September of 1777, he's given permission to recruit a regiment of rangers. They're going to be loyalists operating out of Fort Niagara, and their job is going to be to raid the frontiers. Um, the idea that they can go down the Mohawk Valley and seize territory um, is, is now over. So what they're gonna do instead is launch these devastating raids against rebel settlements along the Mohawk River and south into Pennsylvania as well. In, in uh, the summer and fall of 1777, orders come from England. Um, these are orders that the Lieutenant Governor of Detroit, um, Henry Hamilton, is given. It is the King's command that you should direct Lieutenant Governor Hamilton to assemble as many of the Indians of his district as he conveniently can, and placing proper persons at their head, employ them in making a diversion and exciting an alarm on the frontiers of Virginia and Pennsylvania. So the fall of 1777 is really when uh, these frontier raids begin in earnest. One, uh, one Pennsylvania official wrote to the government of that state 
An Indian war is now raging around us in its utmost fury. A day hardly passes without us hearing of some new murder. John Butler himself um, reporting on the, uh, the frontier raids um, that year, 1777. He said, the Indians of the Six Nations and those from the westward exerted themselves in laying waste the country most exposed to them. Western Pennsylvania and Virginia is now nothing but a heap of ashes. Such of those miserable rebels as have escaped have taken refuge in small forts. So these raids are really uh, accomplishing a couple of things for the British. One, they're, they're tying up manpower uh, that is not available to fight the British Army on the seaboard. Uh, secondly, they are destroying provisions, they are destroying crops that will deprive the Continental Army of provisions. Um, they're going to be forcing uh, Washington to dispatch regular troops into the Mohawk Valley and other frontier areas. And they're also um, helping to provision Fort Niagara uh, because the fort's really at the end of a long supply line. And if they can steal uh, livestock and herd them back to Fort Niagara, that will help to feed the garrison, um, the rangers, the natives that are camped around the fort. So these raids have uh, a military purpose uh, beyond just uh, wreaking havoc on the frontier. Here we see um, a map of the, the Mohawk Valley uh, with some places that we're going to be talking about. We talked about Oriskany already, which is shown there in, in purple. We, you can see Fort Stanwix. But all down the Mohawk Valley, there's a string of forts um, that are built to protect uh, local settlements. So you can, you can flee if one of these raids comes. Hopefully you can flee to the nearest fort and seek safety there. Well, in 1778, um, major campaign led by John Butler. He leads over 700, or I'm sorry, 570 rangers and natives to the Wyoming Valley. Now, Wyoming Valley uh, is a wide, fertile valley in northeastern Pennsylvania. It's where Scranton Wilkesbarre area is today. And the the American garrison of the fort, the major fort uh, there, uh, foolishly decides to leave the fort and attack Butler's force. And they're, of course, led into a trap. And it's a very, very one-sided engagement, uh, about 340 uh, Americans killed. The upshot of this is that most of the upper Susquehanna Valley is evacuated in something called the Great Runaway. So you're having all of these people fleeing the frontier settlements and moving into the more settled parts of Pennsylvania. So this is the major, the major campaign out of Fort Niagara in 1778, and it was a, a huge defeat for uh, American forces on the frontier. Well, the raiding continues. Not every raid was, you know, made up of a large army. Some of them involved, many of them involved smaller war parties. And this is uh, typical of a raid on German flats in 1778. That was a settlement along the Mohawk River. And in this raid, they destroyed 63 houses, 30, uh, 59 barns, 235 horses, two, 229 cattle, and 93 oxen. Only three of the settlers were killed because they had managed to get into the, the fort. Uh, but you're in that fort and you're looking out and your, your farm is on fire, your livestock have either been taken or slaughtered, your crops that you've worked so hard to plant are up in flames. So it must have been very, very difficult um, to be a frontier settler during this conflict when, when these raids were coming uh, completely by surprise in many cases. Uh, luckily for German flats, people had been warned, so they were able to get at least get to the fort. Uh, 
Well, all of these raids along the frontiers of New York and Pennsylvania uh, caused uh, uh, the Congress and the commander in chief to order uh, reprisals. And uh, in the fall of 1778, um, an American uh, detachment uh, attacks uh, Tioga, Unadilla, and Ukwaga. And you can see there um, on the right, there's a map that shows Unadilla and Ukwaga. And of course, this is now displacing native people from their homes as well. So there's a refugee problem on both sides of the conflict. How Fort Niagara is involved is this, the, ref, the native refugees begin to gather at Fort Niagara. There's about 2,600 refugees here in January of 1779. And of course, we all know what January is like at Fort Niagara. So there's another, um, in 1778, there's another raid on Cherry Valley. Uh, this time many civilians are killed um, and it, it's really going to force Washington to do something about the raids. Now here's a map just to orient you to where some of these places are. You can see Cherry Valley there uh, in red um, toward the right. So these raids are penetrating far into the settled parts of New York. Washington is going to order um, the invasion of the country of the Six Nations. Uh, 1779, this campaign under Generals Sullivan and Clinton are going to proceed. Um, part of the army is going to gather on the Mohawk and proceed south to Tioga. Part of the army is going to organize in Pennsylvania at Wyoming and move up the Susquehanna River. They'll join forces at Tioga and then they're gonna systematically move through the country of the Six Nations, burning crops, villages, etc. So you can see their route there, really after they join it at Tioga, they fight a battle with loyalists. There's a few British regulars there, but loyalists and natives, they fight a battle at Newtown, which is shown there on the map. But the, uh, the loyalists and the natives can't hold their position and they are defeated. So for the rest of the campaign, Sullivan's troops basically operating in the area of the Finger Lakes, trying to inflict as much damage as they can on the country of the Six Nations. This of course drives more refugees to Fort Niagara. During the winter of 1779-1780, some historians estimate that as many as 5,000 native refugees may have come to Fort Niagara. And this catches the British completely off guard. They do not have the supplies to feed that many people. What happens is, is a very, very large village of huts, um, makeshift dwellings, uh, grow up around Fort Niagara, uh, between Fort Niagara and where Lewiston is today. You can see this crude map, uh, the Luke map, that was drawn uh, about this time. And you can see the fort there, but outside the fort, you can see representation of some of these uh, native shacks and hovels and huts that have grown up by the hundreds around the fort and, um, and further south along the Niagara River. So this is really a very, very difficult refugee situation for the British to deal with. But it doesn't knock the Six Nations, at least those allied to the British, it does not knock them out of the war. Um, raids again are organized in 1780 and they're going to strike again the Mohawk Valley, the poor Mohawk Valley, and they're going to strike uh, an area south of the Mohawk called the Skahari Valley they leave early, they leave in February. And between February and July, about almost 500 warriors depart Fort Niagara to raid the New York frontier. Joseph Brandt, uh, a Mohawk, 
uh, war chief, leads 300 warriors to destroy Oneida and Tuscarora villages because the Oneida and many of the Tuscarora are siding with the Americans. So in this case, it's, um, it's uh, Native American against Native American. In October, raids in the Schoharie and Mohawk Valleys kill over 100 settlers. They destroyed 1,000 homes, a lot of grain, uh, about 1,000 barns, 600,000 bushels of grain. So this is really one of uh, North America's great bread baskets, these regions. And people, in, including Washington's army, are gonna suffer for this because of all the destruction of these crops. 1781, uh, there is a little bit of, uh, little bit of hope uh, in 1781. The, the, the valley, the Mo defense of the Mohawk Valley um, improves a bit, but there's a persistent refugee problem at Niagara. Um, many, many, many of the natives who took refuge here starve to death or freeze to death over that winter of 1779-1780. But the raiding parties are still leaving uh, the air, leaving the fort. 64 different raiding parties with almost 3,000 warriors going out into the field in 1781. The American defenders, however, um, they started the war with 2,500 men and now the defenders are down to only 800. So it's an increasingly uh, difficult situation for the American effort in the Mohawk Valley. This is also in 1781 when the Loyalist settlements across the river from the fort are beginning to take shape. And that's going to be sort of the nucleus of Upper Canada after the revolution. The war goes on in 1782, uh, particularly in the Western theater. If you read a lot of popular histories of the revolution, they end with Yorktown in 1781. This is where Cornwallis's army surrenders, second major British army to surrender. And this is, this is when, you know, the heart of the, the British goes really out of the war. Uh, after that, of course, peace, uh, peace treaty is signed in 1783. So 1782 usually gets skipped over by, you know, a lot of popular histories. But particularly in the West, uh, the war continued. And uh, there was a, a ma major massacre at Gnadenhutten in Ohio, where uh, angry uh, soldiers, militiamen, uh, massacre uh, a group of peaceful natives. So the, the violence is really on, on both sides of this conflict. Uh, a major, another major militia expedition under uh, Crawford is defeated in Ohio. And uh, Daniel Boone himself uh, is with a force that's defeated at the Battle of Blue Licks in Kentucky in 1782. So the war is continuing, and uh, it's not looking good for the Americans on the frontier. But uh, the frontier war is brought to an end because of successes along the eastern seaboard. By 1783, the Peace of Paris is negotiated. Uh, the American delegation is painted here. The British delegation did not want to be uh, portrayed. So you can see the painting is not really finished. But this brings peace. Um, the United States gains its independence. One thing, though, that continued to be a problem here at Fort Niagara with the Peace of Paris is that many of the Six Nations had fought as allies of the British uh, pretty faithfully through the conflict. And the British really leave them out at the peace table. They pretty much abandon them and don't look out after their interests. Uh, some of the leadership here at Fort Niagara is appalled because they're dealing with uh, the Six Nations all the time and they realize they've kind of been sold out uh, at the peace table by the British government. So it's a very awkward situation uh, for 
uh, the commander here at Fort Niagara. So that kind of wraps up the fort's uh, role in the American Revolution. Um, we would have time for some questions if, uh, if anybody has uh, something to ask. Raise your hand. H. Mueller's got a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself. I, it's not really a question, but I just want to say that um, I have a few ancestors who fought at the Battle of Oriskany, one who died, and Joseph Brandt is my ancestor. Oh my. So which yeah. side did they fight on? Um, the, I have some Americans who fought on the American side and Joseph Brandt who was on British side. I also have a few of them on the British side. Wow. You know, you, you bring up a really interesting point, and it's one that we did not really make earlier in the presentation, and that is that this conflict really, uh, it, it divided neighbors. It even sometimes divided families because some people wanted to remain loyal to the king and others wanted to fight for independence. So in many ways, this frontier war was a civil war neighbor against neighbor, not just um, Washington's army against the British Redcoats. But your question brought up an interesting point. Okay, one of the slides showed the 47th Regiment and it said the Cauliflowers. Why was the 47th Regiment called the Cauliflowers? Well, that's very observant of you um, to, uh, to ask that. Um, from that slide, well, it's it's interesting because sometimes nicknames are awarded for for strange reasons. Um, the British military uniform had uh, lace loops around the buttonholes, um, and this particular regiment had white ones, which made them look like cauliflower. So that's how they got that name the cauliflowers. What happened to prisoners that were captured uh, in these raids? Well, a variety of things could happen to you. Um, if you're a, at your farm in the lower Mohawk Valley and you're taken prisoner, they're gonna march you back, perhaps to Fort Niagara, perhaps they're gonna take you to a native village, um, if you can't keep up or you're going to slow them down, you'll just be killed. Uh, if you do make it, uh, a couple of things can happen to you. You can be uh, adopted. Uh, that happened uh, frequently. Uh, they can still kill you if they don't like you. Uh, sometimes the British would actually ransom captives from uh, native war parties if they made it to Fort Niagara. Um, there's some interesting prisoner narratives. Uh, I recommend you would look up uh, the uh, narrative of Elizabeth Gilbert. It's really an excellent read. Uh, this woman who was, who was taken prisoner and brought here to Fort Niagara. Lou and Logan have a question. If you can unmute yourself. Uh. Were there any raids to Niagara from the Americans? I know that the British held it through the whole war, but were there any raids to Niagara? We have a second question as well. Is Fort Schuyler um, the namesake of the same Schuyler whose daughter married Alexander Hamilton, or is that just coincidence, um, or is that not known? Thank you. Okay, we got two. Two for the price of one. Um, so the first one was, were there any raids on Fort Niagara by the American army? And that's an excellent question. Fort Niagara was a secondary target for the Sullivan campaign. Um, Washington sends about half his army into the country of the Six Nations and their primary target was uh, the native villages themselves. But Sullivan was permitted, if circumstances allowed, to move on to, he had artillery with him. He could move on to Fort Niagara 
And had he been able to do that, uh, the success of the campaign might have been completely different. But he wasn't able to do it. By the time he got to um, just about where Geneseo is now, by the time he got there, it was into September. And one thing that you did not want to have happen to you um, was have your army caught out uh, in the back country in winter. So Sullivan decided that it was getting too late in the season to move on to Fort Niagara. He got within about 80 miles of it, but that's uh, 80 miles is a long way in the 18th century. So he turned around in late September and moved back, uh, moved his army back into the more settled parts uh, of uh, Pennsylvania and New York. So he, um, he did not, no, there was not an attack. The British didn't know that though. And so they didn't know that he was gonna turn back. And that's why they, they sent uh, extra troops out here in, in 1779 to try to bolster the fort's defenses. Okay. There was another. Oh, have... second question. I'm sorry. Yeah, the second question was uh, Fort Schuyler. Uh, it's named after, of course, it was originally called Fort Stanwix, named after a British general in the French and Indian War. So when the Americans rebuild it, they're going to name it after their commander here in the Northern Department, whose name is Philip Schuyler. And Philip Schuyler, I, I don't know uh, his genealogy, so I, I can't answer your question 100%, but um, I can tell you that that's where the fort got its name. All right, well. Yeah, uh, Philip Schuyler's daughter um, is uh, Eliza, uh, I think, who married Alexander Hamilton. All right. So, all just right. interesting, interesting fact. Yeah, cool. All right, so I guess we're out of time. Thanks, you, thank you all for watching. We're going to talk about the War of 1812 on Thursday. So hope to see you back here and have a good day. Enjoy the warm weather. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So long. Thank you.